Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're going to have the opportunity now to hear in just a moment from loved ones, friends, and family of George Floyd. But before that, I would like to welcome to the podium attorney Benjamin Krupp for his remarks. Would you please welcome him? Thank you. I'm attorney Ben Crump and along with attorney Tony Ramanucci and attorney Chris Stewart as my co-counsels out front seeking justice, seeking justice, seeking justice for the family of George Floyd, along with a lot of other great attorneys who are working in the background, who I will mention briefly before we bring up the ones who knew George Floyd all of his life. I want to thank lawyers towing in the vineyards like Devin Jacob, Chris O'Neill, Lee Merritt, Daryl Parks, Jasmine Rand, Bill Pentas, and Carol Powell Lexon, because you may see Tony and Chris and I, but it's a whole team of lawyers who are working because it's going to take a united effort fighting in the courtroom and outside the courtroom to get justice for George Floyd. I will tell you all that because of the coronavirus pandemic, we have to stay on a strict schedule and we all have to do this social distancing. But I want to just put it on the record Reverend Al, that it was not the coronavirus pandemic that killed George Floyd. I want to make it clear on the record. Will Packard, it was that other pandemic that we're far too familiar with in America, that pandemic of racism and discrimination that killed George Floyd. So before we make a plea to justice, we feel it appropriate that you hear from the people who really knew George the boy, knew George the adolescent, knew George the man and from whence George came. So I would ask that his brother Polonis Floyd, his brother Rodney Floyd, his cousin Sherita Tate, his nephew Brandon Williams, please come to the stage and I would ask Attorney Tony Ramanucci and Attorney Chris Stewart to come and stand with me behind them as united they tell the world why we should celebrate the life of George Floyd. Please come up, family. How y'all doing first? My name is Felonis Floyd, brother of George Floyd. Well, 
we come up together. We didn't have much. Our mom did what she could. We would uh, sleep in the same beds, play video games together, go outside and, you know, play catch with the football. And I used to say to myself, like, man, you can't throw. You can't throw at all. You know what I mean? Because the ball never came to me. <laughs> and uh, years down the line, because I was catching with one hand, two hands, any way you threw it, I started being able to catch it. He said, I can throw, but I just wanted you to go get the ball. <laughs> the ball don't need to come to you. You need to go get the ball. <laughs> but, you know, my brother, we did a lot of things together from like talking with my mom, dancing with my mom, cooking with our mom, brothers and sisters, uh, man, so much. We made banana mayonnaise sandwiches together, you know. It was, it was a family thing, you know. Uh, every day, we know when we come in the house, our mom was gonna have a huge plate of food separate from each other and we would sit there and argue with each other who plate it was. And I'm like in like 10 or 11, I'm talking about the plate with six pieces of chicken is mine. And he way bigger than me. You know what I mean? He's huge. So, man, from, from that, being in the house with my brother, man, it's, it's, it was just like inspiring to other people because my mom used to take in other kids and most of them was George's friends. And they wanted to stay with her. They loved her, you know. And my brother, he was okay with it. So then you had three, to me, they were grown then because they kicked me out the room. <laughs> they were three men, like 16, 17. They grown sleeping in the same bed, waking up, going to the same school. <laughs> and they wouldn't leave each other at all. They always wanted to be with each other at all times. And I remember nights when the day before school, we didn't have a washing machine. So we would all go in and put our socks and underwear in a bathroom sink and just start washing them, washing them. If we didn't have detergent, we would use soap. But we would wash them. We were going to be clean. <laughs> we were going to be clean. So we would literally, right after that, we would take the socks and hang them over the hot water heater. And we'd take the underwear and hang them over there. And we would fight about it, me and his friends and all of you like, no, 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 you did it last night because your clothes probably still be damp the next day if you don't put it on the hot water heater. So from, from that, and we learned a lot of stuff, but it's crazy because we would, like, we didn't have a dryer. So the fastest way to dry your clothes was to put it in the oven and let it, let it dry faster like that. So it was just, man, I love my brother, man. We had so many memories, you know, together. I remember him waking me up, telling me, hey, man, can you iron my clothes for me? And I look at him, but then I look at his size, and I say, you right, big bro, you right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was just, it was just amazing. Everywhere you go, and see people, how they cling to him. They wanted to be around him. You know, George, he was like a general. Every day he walks outside, it'd be a line of people, like just like when we came in, wanting to greet him and wanted to have fun with him. Uh, guys that was doing drugs, like uh, smokers and homeless people, you couldn't tell because when you spoke to George, they felt like they was the president because that's how he made you feel. He, he, was, he was powerful, man. He had a way with words. He could always make you ready to jump and go all the time. Everybody loved George. We didn't call him George. We called him Perry. If you, if you called him Perry, you knew him direct. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because <laughs> George was the name. Everybody called him Big George or Big Floyd. You know, Georgie Porgy. He had so many different names. But I'm going to go ahead and let... I'm just, man, it's crazy, man. All these people came to see my brother, and that's amazing to me that he touched so many people's hearts, you know, because he's been touching our hearts, you know. 
Um, you come to Third Ward, where we're from, people are crying right now. That's how much they love them. You know, I'm just staying strong as I can because I need to get it out. I need to get it out. Everybody wants justice. We want justice for George. He's going to get it. He's going to get it. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to echo some of the things that uh, Falon has talked about, and that is that we come from a long line of large family members. Our mothers were siblings of 13. And um, if I can kind of fast forward a little bit, uh, my aunt moved to, she lived in Houston, and she would always talk about being there, not having any of the siblings close, close to her. So my mother decided to move to the Houston area back early 80, 81. And um, so we, we came to Houston and we were all excited that we could have somebody close to us because the only time we really would see each other is like during the holidays or when people would travel to visit my grandmother. Um, long story short, I mean, we didn't have a whole lot, but we always had each other. And uh, we always were taught that, you know, we could always bring other people into the fold, always. Uh, no one should ever go home uh, without having a meal or having food. And so that's how, as he talked about, my aunt was someone in the community that everybody, they called her Miss Sissy. And all the kids loved to come over there. Uh, and she ended up having, you know, 30 or 40 kids that would come over there because they always knew that they could get something to eat if they came there. And not only food, but they could be loved and they could feel part of a fold. So we were raised to always welcome people in and to embrace other people. Um, and so you could see as all these people, no matter who you talk to, they will all say the same thing and that George was somebody who was always welcoming, always made people feel like that they were special and nobody le felt left out and he would enter into a room. Uh, everybody would feel like they were special. He would embrace them. As I think about um, the thing that I will miss about him most is his hugs. Like he was this great big giant and when he would when he would wrap his arms around you, you would just feel like, you know, you were everything could just go away. Any problems you had, any concerns you had would go away. So while we're all grieving, I just want to kind of highlight um, his children, you know, Quincy, Javion, Tanjanika, Tyson and Gianna, and his three year old granddaughter Journey. We all need prayer. But if I am honest about it, we are more concerned about his children and his grandchildren. So I ask as you pray for us as we go along this marathon to make sure that justice is served on George's behalf, or Perry as we call him, I ask that you pray for us and especially for their children. Thank you. Uh, how y'all doing? I am Rodney Floyd, youngest brother of George Floyd. And my older brother PJ was talking about childhood memories and how we grew up. And I would like to start where he left off. We didn't have much growing up, but all that great stuff how we dried and washed our clothes, that was just ingenuity. And I mean, <laughs> and I mean, hey, we worked with what we had, but didn't have much, but we had a house full of love. And I mean, I appreciate the love of everyone in here and the state of Minneapolis. Y'all adopted my brother and showed him so much love. And we feel that love in your city and thankfully everybody and plus around the world. It's a beautiful thing, this great love we're receiving and George Floyd is receiving because he would love it. I wish he was here in the presence in the flesh to see it because all this great unity, he would bring in the tears like it's bringing us. But she had fun remembering my brother, Big Floyd, as, as y'all know. Oh, cooking-wise, he would make me, honestly, him and the other brothers, three gentlemen my brother mentioned grew up in our house, so they would say, Lebro, you make the best grilled cheese. Can you please go make us what? <laughs> I mean, if I tell y'all as a little six or seven-year-old kid, I did that numerous times. I realized as I got older, y'all just using me. <laughs> but, you know, but you know, I was just happy to be doing it. <laughs> but, uh, 
<laughs> but my big brother, I mean, great guy, great gentleman, great man. And as a child, without no father figure, he was big brother. But I didn't see the little stuff that he would throw in there. He was doing the best he can and the mistakes he made. And I watching them, following him, correcting myself as a grown man, as a teenager growing up. And, you know, learning from him how to be a man and everything he instilled us and taught us. He was doing him, but he was teaching us how to be a man because he was in this world already before us. And he gave us a lot of great lessons. And I mean, one thing about a man, keep the definition as is, he flawed responsibility. He would stand up for his family and friends, and he's great at that. And I want you guys to know that he would stand up for any injustice everywhere. Yeah. Oof. Can y'all please say his name? George. Thank y'all. <laughs> I'm Brandon Williams, I'm George's nephew. Um, I call him Perry. You know, we happen to share the same middle name for some reason. My mama wanted to name all of us after some of her siblings, and coincidentally, I ended up with George. Um, growing up, I mean, I'm a lot younger than them, but my grandmother raised me. I didn't have a father figure present in my life, so I grew up in the same house with them. And, you know, my uncles were more of a father figure in my life. And with Perry being an alpha male, you know, I, I gravitated to him. Um, coming up, I played sports. He did. You know, they kind of connected us and brought us real close. Um, I'm trying not to be sad. This is a lot harder than I thought it would be. Um, I just, just remember all, I just remember um, just all of the memories, man. So more than anything, I just want to say thank you to him um, just for being there, just being a real genuine person, just being loving and caring and somebody I can count on no matter what. Um, we didn't have much, but coming up, my grandmother tried her best and wherever she slept, he, he picked it up for me. He made sure I had sneakers and and clothes and a lot of stuff like that and I appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna end it with um, a funny story about um, he was the biggest LeBron James fan. And I remember, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the NBA, but when the Cavaliers, they came back on the Golden State Warriors in the finals. And I remember the very first phone call and I told him, Unc, man, you, you too happy. You sound like you won the championship. <laughs> and we laughed about it, and you know, he said, man, you know how I feel about LeBron. I did win the championship. So, and every time we would talk, you know, I asked him, like, hey, how you doing, man? You good? Uh, and, he, and he said, I feel like I won a championship. And that kind of stuck. It was just this inside thing we had. So, I know with him being the strong person he was and seeing everybody come together and just rally around him and extend all of the love and support to our family and man, we, we, we thankful and grateful and I, I know more than anything with everybody grieving and hurting, he would want us to feel like we won the championship. So i end on that note. Thank y'all. Please give his family another round of applause. Please show them love. Show them love. Thank you all so much for bearing your hearts. If we learned one thing, the floorboards like to eat. <laughs> and also, they had a conversation with Tyler Perry and it was pretty profound because they said we are the big extended black family that you portray Will Packard and others on your movie screens because we all need one another and you can tell this family always needed George and so it's awfully difficult for them the plea for justice is simply this 
Dr. Martin Luther King said, he who passively accepts evil is as much involved in it as he who helps to perpetrate it. He who accepts evil without protesting against it is really like cooperating with it. You know, T.I. on that video, what we saw was torture. Reverend Jackson, what we saw in that video was inhumane. Martin III, what we saw in that video was evil. And so America, we proclaim as we memorialize George Floyd, do not cooperate with evil. Protest against evil. Join the young people in the streets protesting against the evil, the inhumane, the torture that they witnessed on that video. We cannot cooperate with e evil. We cannot cooperate with injustice. We cannot cooperate with torture. Because George Floyd deserved better than that. We all deserve better than that. His family deserved better than that. His children deserve better than that. Yeah. Steve, all George wanted from life is what any of us want. As Thomas Jefferson said in the Declaration of Independence, the unalienable rights endowed by our creator, yes. Yes. Tyrese, to life, liberty, yes. and the pursuit to be happy on this earth. Yes. That's all George was asking for, like any and all of us. But he was denied those rights. And we will seek justice in his name. We will all unite it as a people who are God's children seek justice in his name. But beyond the specific justice, in his case, Chris, the prosecution of the four individuals who deprived George of his life, we seek a broader, more transformative justice. Reverend Al, a more just system of policing. Kevin, a more just treatment of people of color. Chris, a more just criminal justice system. In essence, what we are endeavoring to do, Brandon, is what my personal hero, Thurgood Marshall, said. Make the constitutional make the Constitution real for all Americans. You see, Justice Marshall said, the basis of the Constitution is simply this, that a black baby born to a black mother, the most uneducated black mother, the most inarticulate black mother, the most impoverished black mother has the same exact rights as a white baby born to a white mother, the most educated white mother, the most articulate white mother, has the most affluent white mother just by virtue of that baby drawing its first breath as an American. Now, Justice Marshall said, Reverend Jackson, I know that's not the case in America today, but I challenge anybody to say, Tony, that that's not the goal we're fighting for. He said, I challenge anybody to say, that's not what makes America the great beacon of hope and justice for all the world to marvel. So when we fight for the George Floyds of the world, 
But more importantly, when we fight for the unknown George Floyds of the world, when we fight for the Trayvon Martins of the world, when we fight for the Terrence Crutches of the world, when we fight for the Michael Browns of the world, when we fight for the Alton Sterlings of the world, when we fight for the Philando Castillos of the world, when we fight for the Jamar Clarks of the world, when we fight for the Eric Gardners of the world, when we fight for the Sandra Blands of the world, when we fight for the Amar Aubrey's of the world, when we fight for the Breonna Taylors of the world, when we fight for the Natasha the McKinney's of the world, when we fight for the Stephon Clark's of the world, when we fight for the least of these, what we are really doing is helping America live up to its creed. We are, what we are really doing is helping America be the great beacon of hope and justice for all the world to marvel. But most importantly, brothers and sisters, what we are doing is helping America be America for all Americans. What we want, T.I., is not two justice systems in America, one for black America and one for white America, what we endeavor to achieve is equal justice for the United States of America. And George Floyd is the moment that gives us the best opportunity I have seen in a long time of reaching that high idea that this country was founded on. Thank you so much. This is the plea for justice. On behalf of the family, the children, we will get justice. We are committed to it. Now, I would introduce you to a man who really needs no introduction, who will eulogize George Floyd. He is a man who has fought for so many families that too many hashtags to remember. And when he gets the call, he always answers the call even when the cameras aren't around, even after the cameras are gone, ask Eric Gardner's family, ask Stephon Clark's family, ask any of these families, the cameras have long gone, Tony, but Reverend Al continues to answer the bell when our people call. He is a leader uh, that you see on TV commentating about our experiences, but more importantly, he is a leader who has lived our experiences, and because he has lived those experiences, that's what makes him so effective in commentating on MSNBC about our experiences. And he is going to talk about the experience of the terrible loss of somebody who should be with us today, and that is George Floyd. Please give a great round of applause for the Reverend Al Sharpton.